G'day everyone, it's Matt Rad here and I'm really excited today to have Ewan Fincer back with us. Thanks Ewan for coming along. Thanks Matt, good to be back. Yeah, it's really cool. What, I, what I'll do is I just, if some, some of you may not have heard Ewan's story, but it was just seven years ago that Ewan was doing everything himself from keyword research, actually building the websites, writing articles, just like a lot of you guys are if you're starting out on this journey. But what we're really excited about is fast forward to today, of course, as you may have seen in our other interview, Ewan now has a multi-million dollar content portfolio, a content website portfolio, and he's raised millions of dollars to do that. And so at our one of our recent boot camps, we had Ewan come along and talk to our guys, and there was some the feedback was just so phenomenal. And Ewan shared some really cool updates on what it's like to launch. Uh, what was it, Ewan? 58 websites last year you launched. Yeah, that's right. Probably a little bit more than that if you include some of our bootstrap th- uh, sites. But yeah, you know, not all at the exact same time, but 58 overall. So so, so <laughs> today, what we want to give you guys, I'll share some insight. What is it like to launch 58 content websites? Multi-million, this is a multi-million dollar website portfolio. Not only that, what's it like to run it? And let's look at some of the, the challenges as well, but also some of the, the successes. So you and... I take it, you know, it's been a busy last 12 months for you guys and your team then. Yeah, it certainly it certainly has. Um, but in some ways, we're, we're kind of born for this in that we've evolved over the last seven years, you know, building the team, you know, getting to a point, learning some hard lessons and learning from failure, which is so important. Um, and yeah, and then just, you know, really ramping up this past year, um, you know, it was, a, it was, I like to call it a good stretch, you know, it wasn't a, uh, we weren't doing anything um, crazy, but we were being ambitious, and we, but we were tethered to some sort of reality, some sort of track record, and we had a framework, which is, I think, very important to, uh, to use at scale. And, and you said, so let's go just recap basically what you do. They're, these are primarily content sites, so all they have on them is um, presumably uh, good in-depth information about particular niches. Is that, that that's basically yeah. it? There's no e-commerce so, or anything like that. Yeah, no, we typically do not do e-commerce. These are content, we call them content brands um, and they're uh, getting traffic primarily from Google, although we do dabble elsewhere, um, Google search, and then they're monetized with display advertisements. Um, we also lean heavily into affiliate marketing. Um, and then we do some, we call hybrid partnerships with brands. Once we get to a certain size, um, brands could become very interested in doing kind of custom packages, which gets really interesting. Yes. Um, so, it's, but 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 mainly those three legs, I would say, and we kind of forget about the rest. We don't worry about all the other uh, fun and and interesting business models uh, outside of that. Yeah, so it's nice and simple. So, in essence, you just have, I'm presuming, and we'll talk about it in a minute. You have a big team of writers who write content, and you just post it onto these websites regularly. Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, obviously the writers are the the heart and soul of the company. You know, we wouldn't yeah. be anywhere without them. And, um, you know, we have over uh, 200 writers kind of in our Rolodex, you know, um, all, you know all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences. Um, in general, we like to find experts in their field who happen yeah. to know how to write versus finding uh, expert copywriters. That's maybe a little bit of a distinction, but I think it's very important. And then we have a team of formatters and um, kind of, I, I call them like the production editors who are, they're, they're working on getting the sites live. Uh, so getting the sites and the content live. And then we have our top line editors who are, are looking at, uh, you know, our SOPs, our, our content guidelines, more of our editorial substance. And then uh, yeah. at the very high end, we've now started, uh, we have this new role managing editor, which is essentially a uh, uh, someone who has deep subject matter expertise in a given genre. And they are responsible for a basket or even a whole portfolio of similarly themed sites. And so it's kind of our, our newest iteration. And at the very top, we have myself and our C-suite. Uh, we have um, Amy, who's uh, COO. And then we have uh, Victoria, who are, is our uh, chief revenue officer. Um, we have kind of fractional CTO support and uh, fractional CFO um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're not very corporate. Everyone's a remote co- company. So we have yeah. these roles, but they're very unique to our content business. And they, you probably wouldn't, it, it, when I say CFO or I say CRO, they're probably very different than, you know, what Wall Street thinks of those terms. 
Yeah, so you all work from home like we all do. And isn't it funny how the world's changed? We, we, wall Street doesn't even realise people like us exist where we run these multi-million dollar businesses just working from home um, and all our team is virtual. It's a pretty cool way to live, isn't it? Yeah, and it's funny because we've been doing this forever. I've been doing this yeah. for years. And so, you know, COVID didn't really change much. Um, everyone else kind of had to catch up a little bit. Um which, you know, for better or for worse, that was probably an advantage for us. So your, so your main, so really the essence of this business for you, so I, I want to reiterate to, to everyone listening, Ewan builds content sites from scratch. He's not even out there buying them. These are brand new sites. So they, <laughs> there's nothing out there. And then Ewan comes along and, and picks a niche and puts lots of content on there. And he does it at scale and very, very quickly. So there's a lot of questions that we get asked you. And when, when we talk <laughs> about you and, and you saw at our boot camp, all the, the really cool questions, people loved your presentation. Um, let's start out with how do you find your niches? Like what, what's, what insights can you give us there? Yeah. So, you know, fortunately it's one of those, um, you know, learn behaviors over time, you know, so I, I'm going to say the answer isn't necessarily easy in that, like, oh, it's this many searches per month and this, you know, this niche and that niche, it's, it's more a kind of a framework and um, kind of pattern recognition over time, having looked at many different verticals and compared and contrasted, but broadly speaking, kind of look at three uh, kind of heuristics, if you will, to gauge yeah. the potential of a vertical. We look at, you know, is, is there, you know, are there enough people searching, you know, are there people, yep. what is the size of this market, right? Which is probably where you want to start. Cause if you pick a vertical, that's way too small. It doesn't matter what the rest of the story is. If it, you know, if it, in the best case, it's not enough people searching, uh, you might be wasting your time. Um, and then we look at the, the keyword difficulty. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, how, you know, how competitive is the landscape? You know, in this case, you could go after a, a vertical that has plenty of traffic, but it's been, kind of overdone or there's a, a lot of big media players or even um, more importantly than I, uh, you know, people, a lot of people say, oh, if there's a big media company, I'm not going to go into the vertical. We don't actually mind that because we can outcompete compete them. What I'd be more concerned about is if there are other people like us, <laughs> you know, who yeah. are uh, kind of content first experts with a defined vertical that are already ranking. Mm -hmm. So we, we look at the keyword landscape. We want to make sure there's some room to maneuver and then the final step is, is the juice worth the squeeze? So assuming you have the first two, which is great, uh, it's probably a better niche than not, you know, what is the value? You know, there are certainly verticals yeah. where you can get a lot of traffic, the keyword difficulty is low, but there's either not all good market for the, on the affiliate side or the ad CPMs or the ad rates essentially are, are so low that, you know, it's pennies on a dollar or there's something at, around the vertical that makes it, difficult for advertisers to put spend behind a good example might be here in the u.s um like the hunting hunting space or, or any kind of firearms you know there's there's ways to monetize that but because of the restrictions on advertising it can yeah. be quite difficult to get a good display ad network in place and so you're kind of fairly limited and so you know that's another the third <laughs> pillar to the the stool that's the, the third thing we look at is really is the juice worth the squeeze um, and then, you know, I look at more broadly zooming out, I spend a lot of my time digging through trends and doing trends yeah. analysis. Um, yeah. You know, th there's, you know, th there's probably even within that, there's, there's some things to break down, you know, broadly speaking, you know, I look, you know, Google trends is my best friend. So I keep yeah. that open and I make sure that I, I look it. back, you know, five, 10 years, what is the, what is this trend looking like? And I want to distinguish between a, a, tra a, a trend and a fad. Um, yeah. A fad is something that could be, you know, on TikTok today and gone tomorrow. Um, so, you know, that that's a key distinction. But also another thing I look at is the content durability itself. Um, so, you know, in some, let's say tech markets, there are uh, a lot of opportunities to, to cover new products or cover new problems that are emerging. However, it becomes very outdated very quickly. So, you know, mm -hmm. you're having to go in and update content every six to 12 months. If you think about like your iPhone or something like uh, the current version is only good for a year or two, you know, and then 
you know, naturally that's going to die off over time. So I call this the content shelf life. And so that's another factor we look at. Um, and it's kind of a combination. It's almost a Venn diagram. It's not like a perfect, you know, golden vertical. It's, it's very rare to find that. There's usually shades of gray. Um, but I like to find, you know, as much as I can on the positive end of each of those uh, analysis uh, items. And so you were, you were saying to us too, yeah, the, now you're very much thematic. So you like, I think you mentioned, um, say, the, the classic niche, like pet niche. You're, you're in the pet yep. niche. You're in a, obviously don't give us the exact niches you're in, but you, sure. you go into themes. Is it, yep. And it seemed to me that th there's nothing particularly unusual about the themes you go into. They're all the standard themes we always see online out there in content sites. Yeah, there's, there's nothing too fancy. And I mean, there's only so many broad themes out there that you can cover. Uh, so it's not, yeah. you know, it's like a big secret, but you know, how we cover them at the micro level, that's more of the, I guess the, the secret sauce, if you will, because we, yeah. you know, we think about it in kind of uh, like big, medium and small uh, topical focus. And so, you know, at the very broad end, you know, these are where the big media companies play and we, mm -hmm don't really aspire to be a big media company and we can't really be, you know, we can't compete with that level. Um, but, you know, they, they, they might be like dot dash, like Spruce Home or, you know, yeah. one of the Red Ventures companies, uh, you know, or like uh, um, there's a whole, there's a whole slew of those big companies and they're, they're covering like health, they're covering credit cards, they're covering uh, personal finance, they're covering pets at, as a writ large. And so what we would read, we would rather do is zoom in a little bit. And so rather than talking about, you know, all pets, you know, yes, probably niche it down to dogs, but even then I think dogs is a fairly broad vertical. Yeah. Um, yep. I probably want to niche it down to like, you know, uh, German shepherds or, you know, yep. be that expert authority for your vertical where when someone reaches the site, they're like, Oh, I'm, I'm in the right place. You know, I've arrived. I'm not just in this general content farm, which, you know, the big media companies do a fairly good job of kind of gussying that up to, you know, but their their frame of reference, I would say, is, is magazines. It's what's on the coffee table. That, yeah, you know, that's not that's we're, we have an advantage. And I think our audience has an advantage because we can kind of go small. And, you know, because we're still in that later stage e-commerce adoption, there's a lot of room to run still. And what Absolutely. might be a micro niche today in five, 10 years, I mean, that could, that just by standing in, one, in the same place can be a huge market. And that that's brilliant for anyone listening to this who's starting out and you're looking at building a website. What I want to, what I'm really excited and what you and shared with us at the boot camp was that you go into your, you know, say these last 30 sites, there's a bunch of them that you were telling us they're, they're just micro sites, you know, and you look at the results now a year later. They're literally startup little tiny micro sites. I guess the question that people want to know is, yeah. we all know this is not a get rich quick thing, that this is a slow burn strategy, obviously. So you've got an awesome data set now. You said basically you've gone and launched 58 micro sites last year, right? Let's have a look at some of the results that you're allowed to talk about publicly here. What, what sure. sort of results can you give us or share with us, Ewan, when you look across that portfolio micro sites how's the traffic gone and and what are the trends and and i guess the monetization as well yeah so i'll start off by saying that it's at the beginning like we we look we use frameworks um yep. very big believer in mental models and so one of the the key mental models i think i talked about in the last podcast uh, was our interview was um jim collins you know good to great that's his yeah. book he wrote i love yep. almost all of his concepts it's very simple very kind of like the, the knowledge is out there we just internalized it and modeled it for our corner of the world for for boutique media and particularly latched onto this idea of fire bullets and then cannonballs which is basically a uh, uh, stand in i guess for you know belief, like personal conviction you know because what do i know you know which site is going to be successful you know i have a good inclination and so there's kind of this yin yang of creative chaos where, yeah, I'm finding ideas and I'm putting them through the the, uh, the assembly line of analysis, but it's this creative process on the one hand and this empirical process on the other hand. Those things often seem like they're in contradiction, but you know one of the, the key things I learned from Jim, Jim Collins and elsewhere is like two two things can be true at the same time, and you kind of need that balance of you know finding a good vertical, be believing in it, but then also having some sort of data, and so. 
we basically said is when we launch these portfolios, we launch them in mass um, mm-hmm. and we launch them at the same time. So they form kind of like a data cohort. Um, and as maybe your audience knows with SEO, yeah. it's not, there's not an exact science really to SEO. I mean, there is, but Google's never going to tell us, <laughs> you know, there's a whole yep. industry around trying to interpret what Google thinks and what they say yeah. and what they do can be very different things. So we basically said, look, let's call like let's call a spade a spade and just see what happens. You know, let's let's wait for you know Google to respond and our users to respond to the product that we've put out there. We do it all at once and we give them similar capital inputs. And so mm-hmm. each site gets roughly the same amount of capital. You know, we've set around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of content, which gets us to, you know, around 120 to 150 articles. And we do that in the first three months across all the sites. And so in May of 2021, we launched a portfolio with 26 sites. Then this past yeah. November, we launched one with 32. And so that's yeah. where we get the overall 58 number. But going, you know, obviously the November launch is very early. It's still probably the sandbox territory. But if we go back to the May launch, those 26 sites, um, you know, the first three, six, three to six months, it's not a whole lot, you know, maybe a few thousand visitors. And then mm-hmm. starting in the fall, it starts to pick up. And I think in, let me just take a look here. So I have the latest, but so, yeah. So to give you a reference point, we launched in May by August, the, this, the grand portfolio of the 26 sites was doing around 7,000 page views a month. So that's not yeah. a whole lot to, to look at. not much, you know, yeah. not much, but you know, September, we got up to 11,000. Uh-huh. October, we got up to 19,000. Oh, yeah. We got up. Yeah, November we hit thirty-eight thousand. Right. December seventy-five thousand, and then in January we we hit about one hundred and thirty thousand. Um, right. So you know, and that's mm-hmm. trending up. So we've we've already exceeded that number for February, which is a down month. You know, in terms of just a shorter month. So that's great. Um, we're not even through that. So. Wow! Look at that growth. That's exponential growth, isn't it? Seven thousand to thirty-eight to seventy-five thousand to one hundred and thirty thousand with brand new sites. And I want to share something that you shared at the boot camp ewan doesn't focus on backlinking that's just mainly full focus on good content isn't it yeah and we we do some you know we have some we like to a few techniques like harrow help a reporter out so we do what i call some pr but the focus is really to get the site indexed it's yes, not to yeah. build this domain authority monster you know i think some of our sites are domain authority two, three, four, seven, wow. eleven. You know, these aren't okay. sites that are, um, you know, crushing it. From a backlinker's perspective, they would not be look like successful sites uh, just looking at the backlink profile. Um, but we've made our bet on content and content first. And again, nothing against backlinks. I just think it's the right place to start. And we've never. We've never gotten to the point where we need to build this giant operation around backlinks. And maybe that's yeah. partly because we're also focusing so much on the niche identification, picking yeah. the right market so that yeah. we don't have to rely on backlinks. You know, we're not trying to compete in the mattress space, you know, or the personal finance space. We're not going after these uh, super competitive and cutthroat uh, markets. And th- you're just making me, this is perfect, Ewan, absolutely perfect, because I just realised anyone listening, you guys, you, Ewan is doing what you guys are doing, but at scale. So you just heard, these are the standard little startup sites that all of you listening here should be building. You should be building these websites, the small domain authority, 2 to 11, and it's just, but it's content. And it, I think it gives, you and it gives really good, fr- what an awesome study set, because now we know what happens when you launch a site rapidly. If you've done good keyword research and niche research, 120 to 150 articles, the traffic has gone exponential. I'm guessing within those across that portfolio, actually, I've got another question that, that yeah. did come up that made because it, it looks so simple. I'm just what I've just described is literally doing what our students are doing, but at scale. So it looks really simple, but um, can you talk to us about what's what's the reality, the challenges of getting to where you're at? Because, you know, launching 30 sites, so rolls off the tongue, got all these writers, yeah. it's easy. <laughs> all we're doing is just posting content. It's a walk in the park. What are the yeah. actual challenges? Because so you can you remember seven years ago, you were probably yeah. like our typical student building one to three websites. Can you talk us through 
kind of what happens at that point if any of us want to go like if our some of our students want to go bigger like you what are the yeah. challenges that they that they're going to face there sure and i'll say up front you know it's not like the way we've built our company is not the right way um it's just a way you know <laughs> and everyone's different and i think you know i look at some people that have one or two sites that are gangbusters and i'm like wow i'm yeah. You know, I'm a little jealous of that because we have to manage all these sites. And, yeah. You know, so well, like like our, like our student Lisa at the boot camp. Yes. You know, she, she yeah. just focuses on one website. You met her, and yeah. you know, seven. Lisa figures. was great. So. Yeah, and that's I think a lot of people. And that's realistic, you know. For, for and that, I mean, but that is in and of itself is such an important point. You know, someone yeah. on their own. And I think Lisa mentioned. I think you had said, "Oh, Lisa, you have a, you have a couple writers, right?" And she was like, "Actually, no." And like you know, she, <laughs> she's like, "No, I do most of it myself." And I was that to me, I was that was surprising. And I, but I think that's true. Like this is a business that, that doesn't have to scale to be successful, but it can scale and be, and be quite successful. So it's, yeah. it's kind of um, this choice. And it's also not like you have to, it's not the red pill or the blue pill. I feel like you can <laughs> take steps, you know, to outsource certain things and do the things you enjoy. For example, the thing that I still really enjoy is the pattern uh, recognition and the niche identification. And I love doing okay. keyword research. So, yeah. yeah, we have some data data analysts that support that effort. But if I did nothing else, I would be doing that, if that makes sense. You know, okay. regardless of what yep. industry I was in, I'd be looking at trends and doing a lot awesome. of reading and research. So figure out what you want to do. And so for some people, that may, might actually be doing video or it might be doing the branding or the design. Hold on to those things. You know, don't, you know, I don't, I didn't want to create a company where at the end of the day, I was, I was in a seat that. It might have been, uh, you know, showed, shown growth, but it wasn't a, a seat where I was happy. So <laughs> that's my disclaimer. <laughs> but then in terms of the scalability question, I think obviously going from one, you know, typically the journey is going from one site to maybe three sites. Yeah. And that, that's somewhat manageable. I think probably at that point, uh, if you want to grow further, you're going to start looking at freelance writers if you haven't already. And yeah. that's a fairly well-defined market. You know, you can go out to Upwork, you can go on the job boards, um, you can certainly find other writers, um, but it does introduce some more complexities around, you know, negotiations, rates, um, quality control, project management. Even if you're just managing two writers or three writers, you know, in, in a way they're freelance, but it is their direct report to you. And so that yep. some of your time starts getting taken up by management. And so, you know, kind of describing our own journey, you know, that that's, I did everything myself. And then the first thing I started outsourcing was the, was the content, finding other writers who could fill the gaps. Um, and then it got to a point where uh, I kind of needed someone to help me oversee all these writers. So uh, we started kind of bringing in what I'd call editors or kind of project managers to, to help me or yeah. content managers, if you will, uh, very fractional, but to just help me get the articles out you know, and get them published and respond to all the different writers. Um, and so I think you can, I mean, it depends on the person. You can probably do that up to maybe eight to 10 sites, you know, yeah. kind of have some management support, but mostly have a bunch of writers and, you know, manage those sites. But then, um, you know, what, what I experienced is there's kind of a break point there. That, that to me is still a lifestyle business. It was for me, you know, I didn't yeah. have to be in the office. I could take time off. I could pursue my other interests, you know, yeah. um, but what I realized is I actually really enjoy doing this and there is so much potential. What if we could do something a little bit more and, you know, uh, you know, pretend to be a media company. <laughs> and so then, you know, the, the next layer was a little bit of, a, uh, you know, bringing in, we call the formatters and the, and the editors kind of building a rung below the management that they're kind of moving the articles from the receipt from the writer to getting them live, which is a whole process in and of itself you know, checking the images, the title tags, the, you know, the keywords, um, the spacing, the formatting, all that kind of stuff, adding links. And so that was a kind of a, we look at a lot of VAs or kind of junior editors that that's the kind of role we look at and some of them overseas. So you can kind of arbitrage that price a little bit, but then, uh, you know, that could probably got us to like 20, <laughs> you know, 20 sites or so. Um, and then, you know, back, back in 2017, that's where I kind of was connected to different capital sources. Um, and so that kind of allowed me to think a little bit bigger, yeah. you know, what if we kind of scaled it up even more? And we had actually tried to do some acquisitions, you know, some of them worked out nicely, um, some of them didn't. <laughs> and so that yeah. was, if you kind of remember back, that was my uh, kind of my Waterloo in a way, like that yeah. was the moment where I was like, oh, yeah. 
you know, I, I always thought acquisitions were the way to go, but, you know, having had a couple of experiences where they declined significantly, I realized there's some advantage to the way we were doing things. And if only we could systemize that, you know, if only we could create a, a scalable system around it. And so then we started building on kind of the additional layers of, I would call the HQ support staff. So the COO, the operations uh, team, yeah. and the monetization team, the design team, because then we can start, you know, cycling through these assets and they have a maintenance schedule. And, you know, the, once you get, I think above 20 to 30 sites, you know, you kind of do need um, not just kind of direct managers of the content, you need people that will kind of do the things that you would be doing, you know, thinking about the brand, um, you know, yeah. thinking about the design, the messaging and things like that. Um, and so we launched this pilot program in 2019 with 10 sites. Um, and that was kind of to prove out this, this model. Can we build content sites at scale? I had never built 10 sites at once. <laughs> that was, I, had, oh, okay. I, kind of boot, I had bootstrapped, I you know, and I think that's what a lot of people do. And, and the problem I had with the bootstrapped success story is that, yes, it was successful. And I looked at the end result, but when I tried to go back and identify why it was successful, I didn't quite know. You know, I knew the keyword research was good. I, I knew that the content quality was there, but I, I couldn't really, I couldn't tell you, you know, why things came, fell the way they did. And so what I wanted to do is create this cohort, this data-driven process where we could literally tell the story of early growth. We could basically say, this is what, what the, the life of a site looks like. And we know this is relatively true because we can, we've done it across 10 sites and now we've done it across 26 sites and now we're doing it across 32 sites. And so our data fidelity gets better as we do more and as we analyze the data. And so today kind of bring up to speed, we have like a, you know, our senior team, uh, you know, uh, operations uh, COO, we have our CRO, we have, like I talked about, but we also have built tech infrastructure to support that. So we have yeah. something called, we call it the content conveyor belt which is basically a centralized WordPress uh, login that manages all of the sites, there, you know, all the content. And so what it does is basically a writer can log in and they can, they're tagged to certain sites. And so they only see the articles that they've been tagged to and they might all have custom rate cards and they might have rate cards for different sites. Like a certain site is more technical, so it's a higher rate card. Um, and then the editors can also log in there. It's basically just a, a WordPress WYSIWYG editor. It's just like a WordPress uh -huh. dashboard. And then yeah. when they're, when, once they're complete, it pushes that via API to the right site. And so it's already drafted. It's already formatted. Um, nice. And then it has a payment utility so we can do mass pay, uh, one, cl one click of the button, and just ex ex uh, export a spreadsheet into PayPal. And we can pay everyone, you know, hundreds of writers at the same time because yeah. now we're publishing thousands of articles a month. Um, and that, you know, even the small <laughs> friction point takes like just payment. Yeah. Take, if you didn't have that, it would take three days. You know, yeah, how, so how do you, that, that was, yeah, the other question far out, you're managing over like a couple of hundred writers. And like you said, yeah. even just small friction points can magnify. So you've done so well. And so really you, you learn how to do it. Did that first phase of, playing with one to three sites, lifestyle business, three to 10 sites, still a lifestyle business. And then in 2019, you know, when, what you were just describing, basically that's just when you went big at this. So within the space of what, three to four years, you are now running, yeah, publishing thousands of articles and, and hundreds of writers. That's very, very rapid scaling. Well, it's funny because it doesn't necessarily feel that way, right? But yeah, you're, when you say it <laughs> yeah. that way, yeah, it does seem like it's, it's scaled rapidly. But thanks, I mean, honestly, thanks to our team. And I think part yeah. of that, another trick of scale is letting go. And I think oh, okay. that's probably, you know, what, like where a lot of solo operators have a problem sometimes. And I yeah. know I've felt this is giving up the baby, you know, letting someone else take care of the baby is it's nerve wracking. You know, what if they do something wrong? What if, yeah. you know, they, they make the wrong decision? And the, the thing is that that does happen, but when you empower other people, it's like, it's like an exponential extension. You know, it's, they, they like just today I was overhearing in our Slack, you know, I was on the fly on the wall, didn't say anything. Our team of uh, experts were talking about one of our sites and th they're brainstorming articles, ideas, they're brainstorming branding and where are the gaps in the market. And at the end of the, the meeting, the, the AMA they had, they had a whole list of, of things that I would never be able to find in a keyword tool. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and so that's right. That's giving up delegating, not just delegating like you shall you shall do this task. Also delegating autonomy to yeah. to take responsibility and to be innovative and be creative within the business. So I think that's a big. <laughs> Uh, more philosophical thing, but letting go of that ownership that you personally have over everything. And obviously you're good at hiring. I, I guess that's one of your superpowers. Like, you know, you're a super nice guy, humble. And so you attract in the right kind of people to work with you who are A-grade players. I, I, I'm guessing to be able to scale a business to that size that quickly, it, it, your biggest thing is with, with your team. But yeah, and I will say it's it's interesting when we look back at that, you know, the types of people we've attracted are people from non-standard backgrounds. And I, yeah. like I that's the one thing yeah. I was just talking about with Amy, our, our COO, about like the t- people on our team, they don't, the resume does not read media. It doesn't read, <laughs> you know, yeah. professional, you know, blogger or something. You know, these are people that we're taking creative people, we're taking passionate people, and we're offering them a seat at the table to like, you know, be creative and do their thing. Um, and so that's, I think another key thing is that there is, you know, there is no, there's no marketplace for what we're doing really. I mean, there, there, yeah, there's no. some elements of it, but there's no job board specifically for us. I mean, there's, you know, approximations, there's Upwork, but that's not really built specifically for us. You know, the, our industry is still being created as we speak. Um, and so, you know, if I, if I hired someone from the New York times, you know, they'd come in and be like, what do you mean you want me to do all that stuff? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, it just, it does not translate. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we have such an advantage as these solo operators is that we're coming at it from a whole different frame of, of totally. reference. Yep. And you're, and you're, you're driving that. And so where do you, I know everyone's going to ask this because at yeah. that scale, where are you? So when you start out, Upwork or freelancer is fine for finding writers, but where do you go at your scale? How are you fighting finding so many writers? Well, it's still a challenge. And we, it's such a challenge that we've even created a little service that we've spun off called contentteams.io, which is like helping other like e-commerce brands build their own content teams. Um, okay. It's not, you know, yes, there's Upwork, there's ProBlogger, there's, uh, you know, other places you can post Um we found diminishing returns from those places. We still post there, but really looking at the vertical that you're in or you want to go in holistically, and it's fairly simple, but it's not necessarily easy. It's find where they're hanging out. You know, yep. you know, certain verticals are on TikTok or Facebook or Reddit or forums or, you know, uh, we've even, for some of our verticals, I've even put ads on Craigslist. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it depends, wow. you know, like a good example is yeah. we always, I always say the mechanics, you know, um, we don't want to hire expert copywriters necessarily. We want to hire experts who can also write. And so yeah. sometimes that means finding someone who doesn't think of themselves as a writer from a non-traditional, non-standard background mm-hmm. and helping shape them. We have a, con- we call it a content boot camp where we put all our yeah. new writers through, like this is the, the crash course because it's not rocket science, you know? Um, yeah. You don't need an English degree in, in the modern age to, to write online. That's right. So, <laughs> but like an auto mechanic, their day job is fixing cars, you know? Uh, yep. So they're probably going to be fixing cars on any given day. So how do you take that person and, you know, how do you find those people that are willing to maybe do a little moonlighting, you know, writing for us, uh, but being able to share that expertise and communicate that expertise on our site. You, you've obviously raised funds to do this. Do you get a lot of pressure off your investors? Do they do they understand totally what you're doing? Do they do they expect results like or, or quick results? What's it like working with investors when you're doing such a, a slow burn strategy? Yeah, well, it, it definitely takes. You know, it's not for everyone, and we spend a lot of time. You know, I'm not. I don't come from an investment background, but I spent a lot of time really thinking about that question. Like, who who should we have on board? Um, and, you know, to be honest, there are a lot of people that are maybe not, you know, uh, we're not raising from venture capital. We're not raising, you know, even from family offices. We have a couple, but most of our investors are other successful uh, operators or people who have come from a different line of work, you know, uh, you know, offline success, and they're looking to put some money to work. So, you know, setting those expectations up front, clearly, telling them, look, this is a long game. This isn't immediate. And I think that's, 
by focusing on the, the risk mitigation, I think we actually end up telling a, a fairly convincing story, um, which is based on the reality that, you know, buying sites, which is currently, you know, the main model, whether, whether you're buying an e-commerce business or SaaS or websites, that's kind of seen as the, the attract m a you know, that's the game. That's the mm-hmm. kind of the wall street mantra yeah. is that's the way to success. And you need to have an MBA to do that and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, what we're doing is we're saying, look, we're going to take a little bit longer, but we're going to grow these from scratch. And so it's a two to three year, you know, time horizon. And you got to be comfortable for six to 12 months, not really seeing much, but mm-hmm. we think it's a better risk adjusted return um, because, and, and these assets are, are not going to go to zero. They're only going to, it's, it's a yeah. question really of, is it a two X, a three X or a 10 X? And so that's kind of what we're yeah. trying to solve for. <laughs> Yeah, and so day to day, they're, they're obviously silent investors. Eh? They're, there's not, so they're happy to, they trust you. They give you a pool of money. You've got the pool of money to work. You go away and, and work your magic. You don't, you're not constantly reporting to them. It's not like you're reporting to a board of private equity or anything like that. No, and we have, it's a fund structure. So, we, you know, we keep it fairly straightforward. Um, so everyone knows, yeah. you know, it has to be accredited and things like that. Um I do, uh, you know, send out quarterly reports, you know, kind of more of a, a, a letter, if you will. Um, and we do have, you know, analytics and we share financials and things like that. But, you know, yeah, it's not this this high pressure, uh, you know, which is, I think, is key because otherwise I wouldn't do it. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. that's the key thing is that, you know, keeping it, remembering that we're still at, the, at our core. We started as a lifestyle business and we, we still maintain that element and um we're not you know we're not looking to ipo next month you know that's not our end our end goal <laughs> so wow what what a journey you and I, I bet you when you started out you know seven years ago you didn't think you think you didn't think you'd be sitting here today um you know managing people's money multi-million dollar website portfolio so what what's next over the next few years what what do you have bigger and bigger goals or you just keep just rinse and repeat. What's yeah, your I goals? Think we want first and foremost to have fun with what we're doing and become domain experts in what we're doing and to love okay. the process yeah. and the craft. That's really, really important for everyone, you know, from what I do down to the writers to really enjoy. And, you know, I wish I could share the Slack messages we get on a daily basis from writers being like, man, this is amazing. I've never had someone ask me to share my personal opinion and my story. You know, cool. uh, yeah. a, a lot of times yeah. I feel like in our industry, content is treated like a commodity and it's yeah. not just a commodity. And I think it's, you know, people are behind it. And I think Google's catching up to that too, but it's not just who's, it's not just what's being said, it's who's saying it. Um, and so if we can create a vector, I guess, for uh, for experts to communicate, you know, their knowledge or domain expertise and become better at man- uh, building and managing websites. We're going to take it as, I think, as far as we can, um, mm-hmm. which means, you know, hey, if we can get to 50 million page views a month, you know, in the next five well, years, right. that would be great. <laughs> yes. But, you know, we also don't don't need to get there. You know, we're happy, we're, you know, we're happy just doing what we're doing and enjoying the process. Awesome. That is unreal. Thanks so much for that, Ewan. It's just fantastic to give us that update and we'd certainly love to hear another update in another year's time when you, yeah. when you build out your next 50 websites. But thank <laughs> you so much for being so sharing with our community and, and also for coming along to our boot camp as well. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it.